Welcome to our first exam review session. So we are going to go through three review PowerPoints. I did email them to everybody. And so essentially this exam that will be in week four is going to cover weeks one through three material. So those three PowerPoints, each one is just going to provide a quick synopsis of each week's items and what we kind of learned in that week. So we will jump into our week one PowerPoint first. One moment here. Okay. So week one was all about learning hemoglobinopathies and thalassemia. So we had two PowerPoints, one on each. This is just kind of a nice little chart that um, tells you the key characteristics of each one. Again, hemoglobinopathy, the word itself just means a disease of the hemoglobin molecule. So in this case, there's some sort of structural alteration to those globin chains. So globin chains, again, are amino acids that have been sequenced together to make different hemoglobins, like hemoglobin A, hemoglobin A2, and hemoglobin F, which are found in all adults. A hemoglobinopathy occurs whenever there has been a switch in those amino acid sequence. So all of a sudden, a different amino acid came in place of it, the normal one that should be there and substituted. As a result, it changes the entire hemoglobin molecule, and now we have a unique hemoglobin instead of having a A2 or F. Something else is there. And so it's what we call a qualitative change. So there's the quality of the actual structure of the hemoglobin molecule has changed. Within hemoglobinopathies, there's tons of them. I think I said there was like greater than 800. It's just insane how many there really are. Um, we focused on some bigger ones, especially like sickle cell anemia, hemoglobin C, those are two of the biggest ones. Within that, generally, overall, though, in all hemoglobin FDs, we're always tending to see target cells. That's a really key finding. In sickle cell anemia or in hemoglobin SC disease, anywhere that hemoglobin S is involved, you will also see sickle cells, or what we call trypanocytes. You can see Howell Jolly body inclusions. You can see hemoglobin C crystal if it's hemoglobin C disease hemoglobin SD crystal, if it's hemoglobin SD disease, but most of them are going to be normocytic, normochromic. So the other red cells that are here are typically still normal in size and concentration. The only exception would be the hemoglobin E disease. That one was microcytic hypochromic. So the two amino acid substitutions I asked for you to remember were the hemoglobin S substitution and the hemoglobin C substitution. Those you definitely remember. So what creates hemoglobin S is when valine comes in and is substituted for glutamic acid. Hemoglobin C is made when lysine comes in and is substituted for glutamic acid. Both of these are actually occurring on the beta chain in the sixth position. So that is what is changing them and resulting in a new hemoglobin. So make sure that you go back to the original PowerPoint, look through anything else. I mean, there was a little bit on hemoglobin E I wanted you to know. Um, so kind of just kind of take a glance through that PowerPoint overall, but these are the main key characteristics of it. For thalassemia, thalassemia is what we call a quantitative issue. So you're making the globin chains normally, they're made normally, but there's not enough of them. It's a lack, a number problem. And that's because you're missing a gene or genes to do this. And so we will name the thalassemia based on which chain is affected. So you have alpha thal alpha thalassemias that affect the alpha chain, and beta thalassemias that affect the beta chain. Again, target cells are key finding throughout thalassemias. You may also see elliptocytes, and these are typically microcytic hypochromic. Um, if the thalassemia gets severe enough, like there's a couple like the beta thalassemia major, the one that's transfusion dependent, that one you will definitely see nucleated red cells because the bone marrow is just try to put out any sort of cells because there's just not enough out there. So you might get to see more significant findings on the smear than just these listed here. A couple unique things that were mentioned in the thalassemia chapter, hemoglobin H, remember that results when three out of the four alpha genes are missing. And then hemoglobin BART is when all four alpha genes are missing. So you're missing all alpha, you can't make alpha at all. And so the gamma chains, like, tend to kind of precipitate together and make four gamma chains, which is hemoglobin BART. Remember, hemoglobin BART is the one 
if you were to have that severe alpha thalassemia where you're not making any alpha chains, all four genes are gone, this is the one where the fetus usually dies by the third trimester because hemoglobin BART doesn't function. It doesn't carry oxygen and deliver it the way that it should, thus the baby will die. So again, go back to that PowerPoint, look through those kind of things. We also have study guide. You can look through your study guide at um, think, questions that you answered there. All those are applicable questions. All right, a little bit more on sickle cell anemia because that was such a big disease out of the one chapter. So again, remember the clinical hallmark sign is vaso occlusion. So this is where when your cells begin to sickle, they'll kind of clog, clog up those blood vessels. And then that's what they call the occlusion part, very painful to the patient. Um, sickle cells will form anytime that the oxygen saturation rate is less than 85%. So as they deliver oxygen and get rid of it, and it drops on how much oxygen they have, they'll begin to sickle up. The key screening test with this would be a hemoglobin solubility test. That would be positive. And then you would go and confirm it with hemoglobin electrophoresis. So the electrophoresis will show you what actual hemoglobin molecules are in existence. So when they do the electrophoresis for sickle cell anemia, they're going to see that greater than 80% of hemoglobins in that patient is hemoglobin S. They're not going to have any hemoglobin A, and they'll have some increased S. And if you're just the trait or like a carrier, you're going to have majority still hemoglobin A, but you'll have some hemoglobin S there, just not as much. Again, a reminder, there is another hemoglobin called hemoglobin D that migrates in the same spot as hemoglobin S on the electrophoresis, and it has one of the same substitutions as S. It has two substitutions. One of them is the same. That will show up a positive, oh, I'm thinking of a different one. You know what? I'm so sorry. Ignore that whole last bullet point. I was actually thinking of a different one, and you don't even need to worry about it, technically. So, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go like that. Just take it, leave it as that. Go back to your original PowerPoint to look at that. I apologize for any confusion there. Um, it's a Sunday, what can I say? But yes, go back to your original PowerPoint and just verify that. But overall, if you look at your study guide and look at your original PowerPoint, you can go through. But these are the hallmark key things. Anything that I've asked in a lab critical thinking question or on that study guide, there's a purpose to it. So this is just nice broad overview to bring you back to, oh yeah, that is what we learned in week one. All right, let's go over to week two. Let me bring it up here. So week two. So week two, we learned a bunch of different diseases. Um, so there's four here that you have to just kind of keep separated. Sometimes people get them mixed up. Pelger Hewitt anomaly is when we have those hypo segmented neutrophils. So they are under segmented. They usually just have two lobes and they nickname that this pince nez appearance. So functionally, they're fine. They perform well, nothing, the patient wouldn't even know unless they were told. But the key is to always keep them separated from what we call pseudo pilger hewitt in which those belong in leukemias, different malignancies, things like that, which we would need to treat and worry about. So you guys have answered that question at least once, if not twice, so I think you guys have that down. Chedia Kagashi is when you have these granules inside the neutrophils that have fused together. And they will be very much peroxidase positive. Lysosomes is what we call them, and that's those fused granules. Um, as a result, the neutrophils do not function well because of it. And so there is definitely an increased susceptibility to bacterial infection. There's a couple other things going on in this disease besides just dealing with the neutrophils, but that's the main abnormality that we are going to look at for hematology. Elder Riley is when you're not breaking down lipids called mucopolysaccharides. As a result, those mucopolysaccharides build up in the cytoplasm of the cell, and so it's what we call mucopolysaccharidosis. Um, they look like very large, and lots of them purple to lilac granules. It's very similar looking to toxic granulation, but they are two different things. And then Mayheglin anomaly is kind of a triad, three characteristics here to know. They have these dolly body-like inclusions in the cytoplasm giant platelets, and then thrombocytopenia. Those are the three characteristics. All right, two macrophage diseases, Gaucher, Neiman, Pick. Each one is missing an enzyme. 
So in Gaucher, they are missing the enzyme beta glucose cerebrosidase. I always said put the G together, Gaucher with glucose cerebrosidase, to remember. And the macrophage in the cytoplasm will have this chicken scratch or crumpled tissue paper look. The Neiman pick is missing the enzyme sphingomyelinase, so you'll get this buildup of those lipids, giving it a foamy cytoplasm appearance or what you can say vacuolated. Um, so there is a saying for this. I didn't mention it in my original lecture, but I'll mention it now. Maybe you heard it from somebody already. Again, you do not have to use this saying. It's just it has helped me. <laughs> but um, So a Neiman pick and sphingomyelinase, you remember those two go together. I would say you pick your sphincter, and sphincter looks similar to sphingomyelinase, so you get the idea of how to remember that. All right, um, we did learn about reactive lymphocytes out of this week. Reactive lymphocytes are those that are responding to an antigen, so they're responding to something that shouldn't normally be there, and they will become, the cytoplasm will kind of expand out and start to wrap around different red cells in the area. It'll give this like basophilic tinge to it. So they just look very much enlarged and abnormal. And one of the diseases that we see a lot of reactive lymphs in would be infectious mono, which is caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. We diagnose it by looking for the hetero, heterophil antibody. Usually it's just a mono kit, really easy to do. And then bacterial versus viral. We did answer this on a study guide. I think it was a study guide. Um, so quick ways to just look at a CBC and know if it's a bacterial or viral infection. On a bacterial, you'll see usually an increased white count, increased neutrophil count, because neutrophils are made to fight bacteria. If it's a severe or significant enough bacterial infection, you will also see toxic granulation, stoli bodies, and then vacuoles within neutrophils. All three of those are not normal. We would want to make note of them on our report. Um, but you can still have a bacterial infection and not have those three items. It's just those three will show up if it's a pretty good infection going on. Viral infection normally sees more of a normal or decreased white count and then an increase in the lymphocytes. Some key terms that came out of here that you've answered again on a study guide, and I think I also had in an announcement as a review. Left shift just means increased immature granulocytes. So all of a sudden you're starting to see lots of bands showing up, maybe a metamyelocyte. So cells that aren't, aren't really should be there. But when you start to see those immature granulocytes, that's what we call a left shift. Leukoerythroblastic is kind of a left shift plus nucleated red cells. So you see both the immature granulocytes and immature red cells showing up together. So the two together is what we call leukoerythroblastic. It's commonly a term that we use with a lot of different leukemias, malignancies. And then leukemoid reaction is just your body's over-exaggerated response to an infection. I know in your book, the white count will be at least 20, 25, and up. I think it says in your book 25. So you could put it as greater than 25 even. So that would be a leukemoid reaction. And then relative and absolute counts. Again, another item that was on your PowerPoint and on your study guide. Relative, again, is the percent number. So anytime we are talking about a percentage of cells, like 78% neutrophils, that would be called a relative count. So in this case, 78% is high, we would call that a relative neutrophilia. The absolute number is the actual number of cells, so it can give us a, definit a, de a definitive amount of cells per liter of blood. So that's the difference between relative and absolute. You do need to know how to calculate that absolute. So down at the bottom, it gives you, again, that example. You guys have had to do that. Most of you have done really well with this. It's the white count times the relative put back in decimal form. And then that's your answer. You don't need to move the decimal or anything. That's what you get. So you do need to move the decimal for the percent part, but your answer itself, you don't need to move the decimal. Sorry if that was confusing. All right. Also out of week two, we just introduced some things about malignancies. We learned the difference between leukemia and lymphoma is just where it began, where it originated. So leukemia starts in the bone marrow, lymphoma will start in the lymph system. There has been some linkage with a few lymphomas and leukemias with viruses. The one I did want you to remember was that the Epstein-Barr virus has been very well linked to causing Burkitt lymphoma, and we'll learn about that lymphoma in a couple weeks. And then there has been some chromosome translocations, gene fusions, and the one I did want you to know here 
was the BCR ABL gene fusion. So those are two oncogenes that have fused together and kind of triggered this translocation of chromosomes 922 to create what we call the Philadelphia chromosome. That chromosome in 95% of people is responsible for causing CML, which is chronic myelocytic leukemia. So it's a form of leukemia. So I would know the BCR ABL gene fusion, which causes the 9 and 22 translocation. All right, so that was it for week two. And then finally, last week's material, week three, learned a lot about stains. So first and foremost, why do we use stains or why did they use to? They use more like flow cytometry nowadays, but they used to use stains a lot and some places do. And the reason is, again, and I've said this before, blast cells look alike on a smear. You cannot tell them apart. So when you look at these two pictures, these are two different types of blast cells. And if I were to ask you, okay, tell me which one is the lymphoblast, you're not going to be able to tell me. Tell me which one is the monoblast, you're not going to be able to say. They look alike, right? Those are actually two different lines of blast cells. One is from one cell line, one's from another, and they look similar. They're both large. They both have nucleoli. So when we count these on a slide, on a smear, we're just counting them as blasts. We just put them under the generic tagline blast. And that tells the physician, okay, there's a lot of immature cells, something's going on, and they'll dig further into it. And there's other things that we can do to determine what they are, such as stains. We can determine, are these a lymphoblast? Are these a myeloblast by using stains? So these are some of the stains that we began learning. You guys did a study guide, and use that study guide if you would like. If I put any comments on your study guide, make sure you look at those. I put them for a reason. Um, but myeloproxidase and Sudan Black B have the same purpose. They're both used to help us determine if we have AML or ALL. So with myeloproxidase and Sudan Black B, both will stain AML positive, ALL will stain negative. So myeloproxidase is actually targeting that enzyme found in the primary granules. Again, we're looking at the blast cells for the reaction. Sudan Black B is targeting the lipids in the granules of the neutrophils. Again, look at the blast cells for the reaction. Chloroacetate esterase is what we call our specific esterase stain. That will stain myelocytic cells positive, and it will stain monocytic cells negative. And then alpha-naphthal butyrate and alpha-naphthal acetate are our nonspecific esterases. Those will stain monocytic cells positive, and it will stain myelocytic cells negative. PAS, periodic acid shift, will target glycogen, and it will stain ALL positive, all other AML negative except the erythroleukemia. Erythroleukemia will be positive, but all other AML will be negative. The LAP stain, this one, there's a bit more to it than just knowing it. There's that whole calculation part. Um, but essentially, one of the reason you can do it is to look at whether you have a leukemoid reaction or CML because they look similar on a smear. Both will have high white counts. Both will have less shift, similar cells involved. So if you did the last stain, a leukemoid reaction will have a high increased result. Sometimes it's normal, but otherwise increased. CML will have a low result, so that will help separate between them. And that one is unique because we do want to look at the band and segmented neutrophils in that stain for counting. So you do want to look at those. And then finally, TRAP. TRAP is used just to diagnose hairy cell leukemia. And so we always say you trap your hairy monster to remember. All right, so here's more information on how to score that lap. And you do need to know how to do this. So you're going to look at 100 band and segmented neutrophils and look at how they stain, what the reaction with the stain is, zero to four. Zero B, they didn't have any reaction with that stain. Four would be an intense reaction. So you'll score them, and then once you're done counting 100 and scoring them, you're gonna multiply the scores. So in the example in the chart, you have zero times 20 is zero, one times 45 is 45, two times 25 is 50, and so on. Once you multiply each one across, then you add up that last column, and that is your lap score. So please be familiar with how to do that. A normal lap score is 20 to 100. So anything above tends to be maybe one of these. I mean, there's other possibilities out there, but these are the ones I always give. Anything low would maybe be one of these disorders. And then cytogenetics, we had a very brief PowerPoint on that. Again, that's the study of chromosomal abnormalities. 
we reminded you again to keep knowing that CML Philadelphia chromosome here. And then there was one other one we added in. There's a chromosome translocation for a leukemia called acute promyelocytic leukemia, and that is a translocation between 15 and 17. We will learn this more. We'll see this leukemia brought back up in a couple weeks here. Okay, so that is it. There's probably week three is maybe the most intensive because of the stains. I know stains can be tough for everybody, but do your best. Go back and look at your original PowerPoints out of the lectures. Um, these, again, were just nice big overviews on what to expect. So that's it. If you guys have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I wish you guys good luck and have a great week. Thanks.